Our fifth speaker is the Commissioner of the Commission on Human Rights. She has served the Philippine government for the past 30 years, 27 years of which has been devoted to human rights advocacy, including nine years as the first director of the Commission on Human Rights Child Rights Center. A career executive service officer for since 1998, her last post before her appointment as commissioner was the director of Government Linkages Office, or GovLink, now renamed Policy Advisory Office. She's engaged with stakeholders in discussions on various human rights policy, working towards the passage of laws which include the Juvenile Justice Welfare Act, the law prohibiting the imposition of the death penalty, International Humanitarian Law Bill, Anti-Torture Act, and recognition and reparation of martial law victims, among others. She has staunchly advocated for the rights of persons deprived of liberty, which earned her a Gawad Paglilingkod or Service Award from the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines Episcopal Commission for Prison Pastoral Care. Her programmatic innovations in human rights advocacy include the human rights-based approach to legislation and groundbreaking engagements in the CHR in the human rights promotion and protection mechanisms of the United Nations. Meanwhile, the Commission on Human Rights is an independent national human rights institution created under the 1987 Philippine Constitution. It is mandated to conduct investigations on human rights violations against marginalized and vulnerable sectors of the society involving civil and political rights. As a national human rights institution, the Commission upholds six fundamental characteristics independence, pluralism, broad mandate, transparency, accessibility, and operational efficiency. It's her pleasure to welcome Commissioner Karen S. Gomez Dumpi. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, uh, good evening, everyone, and allow me to start by, of course, thanking Proud. International for um, organizing this forum uh, and for the commission to be able to address you tonight and um, uh, to be able to contribute to this discourse on ideal leadership and good governance. Leadership and good governance are such important topics these days, not only because of the coming presidential elections in May 2022, but also because of our current situation brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, which some view is the result of poor leadership and governance, or for some others, the lack thereof. I don't intend to just talk to you about abstract concepts, but um, uh, allow me to just share that I will discuss these concepts and principles in light of what we are experiencing today, and I'll try to cover three main points. First is the current state of governance in the Philippines. We've heard other speakers uh, speak about that and highlighting its implications on human rights. The second is about the relationship of human rights and good governance and why governance must be informed by human rights standards as we build back better. And finally, just a few points of reflection on the state of governance and human rights in the country. So when the Duterte administration rose to power in 2016, the Philippines was among the countries around the world that were swept by what could be a tide of authoritarian and populist regimes. That's a negative example of what ideal leadership and good governance should be. So uh, we saw the rise of populist leaders around the world. In an article by a good friend, um, uh, Professor Nimia Simbulan, she stated that these regimes are marked with governance styles and approaches that seriously affect the state of democratic institutions and processes and undermine fundamental freedoms and violate the human rights of the population. These regimes are reminiscent of leadership styles of many authoritarians of the past, just like our experience during martial law years or the martial law years under the Marcos dictatorship, where checks and balance were reduced to almost zero after the late dictator concentrated all executive and legislative powers to himself while human rights violations abound. This time through technology, particularly social media, is now being promoted to it's now being used to promote simplistic narratives. And in recent years, we have seen the proliferation of fake news and disinformation. 
These have been used to justify the protracted drug war, which we all know is replete with human rights violations. Project the image of a strong man supposedly in control even amid promoting a misogynistic culture. Curtail freedom of expression and of the press and persecute the dissenters and human rights defenders. Using social media, revisionists have been building an, a different narrative or story to pro portray that the previous martial law years as the golden age of the Philippines. Past years have seen the return to the national political stage of um, uh, uh, many actors during uh, the martial law years. And if you search through YouTube, you will find channels uh, with content that are all praises for the past um, uh, uh, dictator and only highlight the good over the two decade long Marcos rule and does not or does not talk about the torture, disappearances, deaths, and many other human rights violations that occurred and are well documented in our history books. Um, Professor Simbulan actually cited some characteristics common to these populist and authoritarian regimes across countries. And I'll share some of them with you um, as it can be easily linked to the current style of uh, this uh, particular administration. First is the projection of the head of government as a decisive leader who is strong-willed, nationalistic, um, who puts the nation above all else, relentless, relentless in solving the country's problems, particularly poverty, crime, corruption, and thereby creating a cult uh, of personality. And next is the laying out and overemphasizing of one particular problem, usually having to do with criminality to heighten people's sense of insecurity and fear. We have seen this with the government's rhetoric on the war on drugs and the centerpiece policy of the Duterte administration. And this has caused lives of the marginalized, disadvantaged, and vulnerable. Of course, there's no de debate that the drug problem is a menace, but it's also not only just a, um, um, a uh, national, um, it's not only a societal problem that uh, would um, uh, necessitate law enforcement, but it is also a health issue. So populist governments actually take advantage of the discontent of citizens with the tr traditional political elite who are seen as corrupt, using their government positions to consolidate political and economic power for themselves and failing to address poverty and inequality. While it's true that previous administrations have not successfully eradicated corruption in government, it probably is a bigger problem today, especially because we are in the middle of a pandemic. And as you know, in recent weeks, uh, the Commission on Audit flagged the expenditures of some government agencies. And this was met by strong criticism from the executive, which is unfortunate because the Commission on Audit is an independent constitutional commission that served to check all branches of government. So, so populist governments also perpetuate the narrative that human rights norms, standards, and principles get in the way of real progress on these serious problems. They undermine the ability of the press to act as a counterbalance or check on government power by questioning traditional media, um, uh, media that is critical of government actions. In the past years, we have now seen supporters, how supporters of this government created a narrative that pitted human rights against each other. Human rights defenders and journalists have been targeted as contra to government's crusade to illegal drugs or in recent times to curb the spread of the COVID-19 virus. One of the ways by which uh, one of the ways through which good governance can be achieved is by mainstreaming human rights in governance processes. Human rights and good governance are mutually reinforcing. Both are important in fostering a democratic society, governance that is informed by human rights norms and standards, and create an environment conducive to the realization of all human rights. And it bears stressing that human rights affect each and every part of our daily lives. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights identified four key areas 
where humanize and good governance intersect. And it's along these lines that I invite you to reflect on the kind of leadership and governance that we are seeing, especially at this point in time. Democratic institutions play a central role in good governance. It creates avenues for public participation and an important cornerstone in human rights, recognizing that the people need to be empowered and that they can contribute to finding solutions to their own problems. In the realm of delivering state services to the public, good governance reforms advance human rights when they improve the state's capacity to fulfill its responsibility to provide public goods, which are essential for the protection of a number of human rights, such as the right to education, health, and food. Rule of law is also important in good governance and human rights as it ensures that the rights of individuals and groups are protected from any arbitrary exercise of power. Finally, I reiterate that corruption is a human rights issue. In fighting corruption, good governance efforts rely on principles such as accountability, transparency, and participation to shape anti-corruption measures. I leave you with um, some points for reflection. Have government processes been responsive to the needs of people during this pandemic? To what extent is the kind of governance we have today inclusive, especially those in the fringes of society? And what change in governance do I want to see or we want to see? Or am I willing to do to see that change? I hope these questions can give uh, all of us some serious thoughts and guide us in our exchanges. Um, and I hope we can all do something to help effect positive change in our society. I'm going to stop there and I'd love to um, answer some of your questions if you do have questions. And thank you again for this opportunity to be addressing you tonight. Maraming salamat po.